Hello, and welcome to our Facebook Live today. My name is Elizabeth Franklin, and I'm president of the Cancer Support Community. For more than 35 years, we at the Cancer Support Community have been a relentless ally for anyone impacted by cancer. We help individuals manage the realities of this disruptive disease and get back to their normal. Whether accessing our free services in person at one of our 175 locations, online, or over our toll-free helpline, you are getting a team of licensed professionals providing patient navigation, financial counseling, genetic counseling, pediatric support, and so much more. So today, we are thrilled for you to join us. We're going to be talking about glioblastoma, an aggressive type of cancer that can occur in the brain or the spinal cord. It's a fairly rare diagnosis, but chances are that you've heard of it because of media coverage of Beau Biden, the son of um, President Joe Biden, who died, and as well as Senator John McCain, who also passed away from the disease. With glioblastoma, the tumor and treatments can impact both the body and cognitive functioning and may even cause changes in personality. Part of what makes this cancer diagnosis so complex are the number of different doctors and specialists beyond the traditional oncology team involved in caring for the patient because of the impact on the body's neurological system. Glioblastoma, or because that's a bit of a tongue twister to say, and I'm not gonna get through the hour saying it over and over, we'll use the acronym GBM. It's the most common type of brain and spinal cord cancer among adults. I am incredibly grateful to have a friend of CSC here with us today. She's an expert who will help us understand the many challenges and also shed light on new treatments and approaches that are being used to treat this disease. So we are joined today by Jennifer Cerventi of the University of Rochester Wilmot Cancer Institute. Jennifer is a board certified physician assistant and she joined the University of Rochester Medical Center in 2007 as a neuro-oncology research associate and physician assistant. She has earned her certification as a clinical research professional as well. And Jennifer's interests include a complementary approach to brain tumor management and quality of life issues, which at CSC, we are always thinking about um, both the medical, physical, as well as quality of life and the full patient experience, which is why we love working with Jennifer. And her role in the neuro-oncology program includes assisting in the day-to-day -day care and treatment of patients with brain tumors, spine tumors, and cancer-related neurological deficits. In addition, Jennifer facilitates and coordinates clinical trials associated with brain tumor treatment. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Of course. And I also would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor of today's sh show, which is NovaCure. So thank you so much for your support so we could bring this Facebook Live about glioblastoma or GBM to our audience. So Jennifer, I'm gonna kick us off. I know that in the introduction, people probably heard me refer to you as a physician assistant. So I wanna start there because it may be a little different than, than what some cancer patients are used to. Can you tell me about um, what is a physician assistant and what's your role in the cancer care team? Uh, absolutely. So a physician assistant or a PA is a licensed and board certified medical provider who works as part of the team, often with a physician and uh, registered nurses and maybe nurse practitioners. Um, and a PA's job is really to diagnose and treat illness. Uh, we independently see patients um, from the physician, so we can independently see patients in the office, but we are doing that under their supervision. Um, my role as a PA in the neuro-oncology team is really to see patients in the office visits, manage, as you, as you said, their day-to-day -day care. I prescribe all of their medications and monitor their chemotherapy. I prescribe their tumor treatment field therapy, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I manage their seizures and all of their medication medications, such as their steroids. And then another big part of a PA or a nurse practitioner's role in this kind of an oncology team is to provide an additional layer of support when it comes to emotional and psychological coping for patients and caregivers when we're dealing with a disease like this. I was going to say, anytime I've come into contact with a PA or a nurse practitioner, I have loved the experience. So I hope that, that our viewers today get that from, from this as well. So thank you so much, Jennifer. 
So I want to take a step back and talk about the brain because it is, you know, one of the most incredible parts of our body and, and something that a lot of people, um, we, you know, we just don't know that much about it. We know it controls emotions, memory, and movement, um, but it's it can be mysterious. So can you explain the full scope of the role of the brain and spinal cord in the human body? Sure. Um, so yeah, so the brain and the spinal cord together create what's called the central nervous system. Um, the brain is kind of command central of everything we do, everything we use our bodies for. And that's both in voluntary activities like walking and talking and involuntary activities like the beating of our hearts, the regulation of our hormones and our, our electrolytes and our bloodstream, our reflexes and our sensations. Um, the brain interprets information from other organs like our eyes, our nose, our ears, our mouth, our skin. And it takes that information and, and translates it for us so that we can understand what's going on for us in the world around us. Um, it's also, as you mentioned, the center of who we are as human beings. So our emotions, our personality, our understanding of social norms, it's all located right there in the brain. The spinal cord, the second part of the central nervous system is essentially a highway that carries information back and forth from the brain to the rest of the body. And so every organ below the level of the brain relies on that highway for the information that it needs in order to carry out its normal activity. I love that. Thinking about the spinal cord as a highway, it, it really helps to get the, the picture across. And, um, you know, brain cancers, there's, there's a group of different kinds of brain, brain cancers. I know we're going to talk specifically about GBM today, but can you talk about, you know, a quick overview of brain cancers as a group? Um, we know that tumors can be benign or malignant. A cancer can also spread or metastasize to the brain. Um, I, my mother had um, a meningioma, which is a benign tumor. And so I, and I think a lot of people have experience with brain tumors as a whole. Can you just give us a brief overview of those? Sure. So uh, we tend to break brain tumors up into buckets. Um, and kind of the first bucket is whether it's primary or what we call secondary. Um, secondary tumors, also known as metastases, as you mentioned, are cancers in the central nervous system that have spread there from other parts of the body. So a lung cancer or a breast cancer that has spread to the brain or the um, spinal cord. And so, um, Primary brain tumors are kind of the opposite. They start in the brain and they stay in the brain or the spinal cord. So while primary brain tumors can spread to other parts of the central nervous system, they're not going to spread outside of the central nervous system. So we really don't have concerns when we have a brain tumor that's a primary brain tumor. We don't have concerns about needing to look at the lymph nodes or the bone or the lungs or anything like that. We can also categorize brain tumors based on their level of aggression or how quickly the cells within the tumor duplicate and grow. Um, so there are tumors that tend to grow more slowly and those are often described as benign, like your mother's meningioma. However, I would argue that, you know, that any, any mass that's in the central nervous system, which is, as we already described, is a very, very important organ or set of organs, any mass in there is kind of hardly benign. Um, because benign kind of indicates that it's not a big deal. So some people kind of use the words benign uh, they, 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 they don't use it quite properly in my, in my opinion. Um, then we have the malignant tumors. So those are the ones that are clearly those that are going to grow more aggressively. They're going to have a higher turnover of cells and, and are going to have a higher chance of neg negatively affecting the length of someone's survival or how long they're going to live. And so those are the two kind of main buckets, primary or secondary, malignant or less, mal less malignant, I would say, versus benign. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jennifer. Having gone through the experience with my mom, I can tell you that it's no less scary, right? And she had brain surgery. So even though it's benign, it's still a really scary experience and caused her lots of, of side effects and things. So I appreciate you you giving that uh, little piece of information around it. So tell us now specifically about GBM. What is it? How does it interfere with the brain's functioning? Just an overview of GBM specifically. Yeah, so GBM or glioblastoma, as you had mentioned, is the most common and also the most aggressive of the primary malignant brain tumors in adults. Um, GBM starts in the vast majority of patients just out of the blue. It's kind of like getting struck by lightning. It was just bad luck. 
Um, there's, there's not anything that we know of at this point other than very specific things that are very, very rare that actually lead to someone developing a glioblastoma. So, um, you know, it's not smoking, it's not diet, it's not exposure to cell phones. It just happens like the majority of cancer, unfortunately, that it's, it's very unpredictable. Um, but what GBM is, 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 is a, is a, a, a brain cell, a normal brain cell that one day kind of took a wrong turn. It was supposed to go left when it went right and it grew into a mass. And these masses, these glioblastoma masses, like to they like they like to create a solid mass, but they also like to to infiltrate into the normal brain. And you might read about fingers or tentacles. Um, these tumors do um, do invade the normal brain tissue around that initial mass, and uh, those tumors can cause pressure and swelling and really the inability of that involved brain to send and receive those signals to and from the rest of the body that I had mentioned. Um, and so that's, that's essentially what a GBM is. Okay, great. And how, you know, what are the symptoms that, that patients experience? I know you mentioned seizures. That's one of the main ones that can be really scary and especially that comes out of nowhere. Um, but how do people determine that they have GBM and what do the symptoms look like? Yeah. So seizures are definitely a common presenting symptom of these types of tumors. Um, oftentimes a person will prevent to an, present to an emergency room after experiencing a loss of consciousness um, sometimes associated with kind of a rhythmic shaking and stiffening of their arms and legs, and that's called a generalized seizure. That can be very scary for a family member to witness. Um, or perhaps the patient comes in just because of some um, abnormal movement in one side of the body or just one side of the face or just one arm or leg, and that's called a focal seizure. There are quite a few other seizure types kind of in between that can occur. Um, but most commonly we see these generalized or focal seizures. Um, again, they're very scary to watch, but it's important I think for families and patients to know that seizures are rarely dangerous. It's highly unlikely for someone to die of a seizure, but in the moment you, you really feel like your loved one is dying. It's really, really horrible to watch. Uh, in addition to seizures, the most common presenting symptoms of a primary brain tumor or even a, a brain metastasis uh, our headache, especially headache in the morning when waking up, weakness of one side of the body. And then we will also see patients present with cognitive or personality changes. And that would either be, you know, going into the primary care physician with saying, you know, a family member saying mom's just not herself or mom's very forgetful or mom's having mm -hmm. headaches in the morning or something more acute like the seizure where someone would present to an emergency room. Yeah, and I think it's so helpful to hear you say that seizures are rarely deadly, but that doesn't make them any less scary. And I know having gone through it with my mother, it's really scary, especially when you think about like she was driving the first time she had a seizure. And so, you know, those types of things, but it is comforting to know that they are an indication, but they they aren't necessarily something to, to be quite so scared of, although we know that they are scary to watch for sure. Absolutely. And when a patient presents with these symptoms, um, what does the diagnostic process look like to figure out that they have GBM and, and kind of rule out other potential um, uh, reasons for these, uh, these effects? Yeah. So when a patient has one of these symptoms and presents to either a primary care physician's office or to an emergency room, they're going to undergo a pretty standard regimen of tests and exams. So someone a medical provider, a doctor, a PA, or an, or an NP is very likely to perform a neurologic examination. During that examination, they're going to be checking the patient's cognition, their strength, uh, their sensation, their reflexes. They're going to have them walk and see what their balance looks like. They may then order a CAT scan or a CT scan of the brain, which is um, an imaging modality that uses radiation to show kind of a basic or rudimentary picture of the brain. This CAT scan can show large masses and swelling. It can also show bleeding in the brain. But really the gold standard or, or, the, or the, the tool that we use the most in diagnosing, diagnosing a brain tumor is something called an MRI. And an MRI is another radiology test, but instead of using radiation, it uses a magnet, a very strong magnet, not that radiation. And it shows a much more detailed picture of the brain structures. So if a mass is identified on a CAT scan or an MRI, likely a neurosurgeon is gonna be called. Um, the really first step in identifying what is going on after you see a mass is to actually get a piece of the tissue. And so the neurosurgeon will have a conversation with the patient and the family about what the best approach to getting that tissue is. 
So they may decide that if the tumor or the mass is very deep or is an area in an area of the brain that would be too dangerous to try to access, they may decide on just doing what's called a needle biopsy, where they just thread a very thin needle uh, into the tumor to take some of that tissue out to be examined. In other cases, if the tumor is in an accessible area or the neurosurgeon feels like they would get a lot of benefit from taking out that mass or taking out a portion of that mass, then the patient may have what's called a craniotomy with a resection, either a partial resection or a total resection of the tumor. And that decision, like I mentioned, is really based on um, the risk of causing significant neurologic damage in the operating room. Once that tissue is removed, either by biopsy or resection, it's sent on to the pathologist. And the pathologist is going to examine that tissue under the microscope. Um, and, and there are certain criteria that we need to see in order to diagnose certain illnesses. The pathologist is going to do very special staining on, on that material. They're going to send it out for other special testing. And within a couple of weeks, we get a report back from the pathologist telling, telling us exactly what type of tumor we're dealing with. Gotcha. So it really is a multidisciplinary team approach to GBM because there's so many different professionals involved along the way. And as you're talking, I was thinking, yeah, I would really want to talk to a PA throughout this process because there's so many different pieces to it. And I'm sure you, you feel like you might even serve as sort of a home base for them, I would guess. We absolutely do. And, you know, so I'm in neuro-oncology. So our job is really to oversee the entire care from start to finish for a patient with a glioblastoma. And when I'm meeting a patient for the first time, that's exactly what I explain to them, that we are home base, or I use the football reference. I tell them that we are their quarterback. Yeah. Uh, it can be very overwhelming for patients and families to have so many different teams that they have to go to. They've got the, the primary care physician, the surgeon, they're going to have a radiation oncologist. They may have a palliative care specialist. Um, there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So I always tell them, the neuro-oncologist is home base. You always come to us for anything that you're not, if you're not sure who the question is for, it's for us. And then we'll help you triage it. Yeah. I love that. I feel like every cancer patient should have home base, but especially with GBM, it's incredibly important. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that at CSC, we advise all newly diagnosed people to do with any cancer is to know exactly what their cancer is and what the stage is. But in the case of GBM, in, instead of stages, the cancer is classified by grade, which is, is often new information for people. So can you talk to me about what grade is and what do patients need to know about their specific GBM diagnosis? Yeah. So um, like you mentioned, most cancer is staged. So we all, have, we all know someone or we've heard someone who has uh, you know, stage two breast cancer or stage four lung cancer. Staging indicates for us, it gives us a picture of essentially how aggressive the cancer is, how far or how significantly from the initial area has it spread? Has it spread to other organs? Has it spread to lymph nodes and that kind of thing? I had already mentioned that glioblastoma doesn't do that. It doesn't spread outside of the central nervous system. So staging doesn't really make any sense for this disease. So we do use a grading system like you mentioned. So primary brain tumors, which are not gonna leave the central nervous system, um, are examined under the microscope and they are given a grade based on how aggressive the cells are. And that grade ranges from one to four. Four, uh, or, or I should say a glioblastoma is by definition a grade four tumor. It is the most aggressive type. Um, so it's important for patients to understand their grade so they know how aggressive a, a tumor it is. It's also important for them to ask questions about some of the um, more recent developments we've seen in really characterizing primary brain tumors. So there, there are some other um, labels that we give primary brain tumors. We talk about IDH, which is kind of a, a, a prognostic um, indicator. And then we talk about MGMT, which is an indication of how how responsive their tumor may or may not be to chemotherapy. And so, the, so nowadays, instead of just saying they have a glioblastoma, we might say something like this patient has an IDH wild type MGMT methylated glioblastoma. And that gives us as the care team a lot more information about what to expect and also about what kinds of treatments we might be offering these patients. Absolutely. So exactly. 
what you just said is why it's so important for patients to truly understand all aspects. And, you know, I think that when patients get diagnosed with any cancer, most people feel like they're dropped into a land where they don't have a map and don't speak the language. So to have somebody like you by their side to help them understand what all of this means and why it's so important to, for them to understand is incredibly important as they go along this journey. I think it's and also- we have, really um, we have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, just, just along those lines, it's really important for patients, if you're not understanding what your team is telling you, to ask them to put on the brakes and to say, can you explain that to me again? Or can you explain it to me in a different way? Or can somebody else explain it to me? Because they may have a different way of explaining it. That's, that is great advice. And um, we actually have a, a comment on the Facebook Live that I want to go ahead and ask you because it plays into this. And it's someone who said they have a loved one who was given 12 to 15 months with um, their GBM diagnosis. Um, it looks like probably um, grade four, but it's been six years and 42 scans. And so they want to know when doctors give their estimate of time for a terminal case, What's involved in that? You know, can you kind of walk us through that process? Because I think a lot of people dread that conversation. And As obviously this person has, <laughs> has greatly out there. Absolutely. Everyone does. So just talk to us about that. Yeah. So first of all, cheers. You know, six years with a glioblastoma is wonderful and remarkable. And I would say that every neuro-oncology practice has those patients. Those are the patients who who you know, beat the odds. Um, and, and what the odds are is simply the statistics that we have. So when we see a new patient in the office, really all we can give you are, is the data based on statistics. We can tell you that in these big studies, this is how people did. This was the, the average or what we call the median. This was, this was how this therapy, um, you know, this, 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 this is the results that this therapy gave this big bunch of people but we can't tell you exactly how you're gonna do because you are an individual person, you are not a statistic. And it's also important to know that when we're talking about statistics, um, you know, that's, for example, it's a thousand patients who were thrown into a bucket and then we're, we're, we're spitting out some mathematical um, you know, numbers at you, but there are patients in that bucket who did really poorly and patients who did really amazingly. And then the majority of patients who did somewhere in the middle. So it's kind of like hitting the lottery with a glioblastoma to, to have survival like six and seven and eight years. Um, we have a patient in our practice who's 22 years out from their glioblastoma. And we even went back and looked at their tissue to be sure, was this really a glioblastoma or did we get it wrong two decades ago? And it really was. So um, it's impossible for us to predict when we're sitting in a room with a patient, whether they're going to be one of those amazing long-term survivors. We do get some hints to that based on some of the prognostic characteristics that we know lead to long-term survival. Those are young age, um, having a really good resection of the tumor, uh, being in very good neurologic condition, um, and having MGMT methylation of their tumor. Um, but again, there are people who don't fit that mold who do great. And there are people who do fit that mold who don't do so well. So extremely difficult to predict. And Jennifer, do you have patients, you know, I, we've talked to patients through the cancer support community. Some say, you know, give me the data. I want to know. I want to understand the stats. I, and, and we have others who say, I don't want to know because I'm not a statistic. And so do you, is that how you guide your conversations with patients by finding out what they want to know? Absolutely. So at the U of R, and obviously every, you know, every uh, institution is going to, kind of, or every doctor is going to have kind of their own way about this. But here at the U of R, we tend to explain to patients out of the gate that this is not, um, and we're going to actually talk about this, but this is not a disease we have a cure for. You know, we don't have a formula to get somebody to that six years or that 22 years, um, but we do have treatments for it. And then we tend to ask if they want to know more about the statistics, more about their expected prognosis. Um, I think it's important to let people get to that place on their own. Um, there certainly are some situations where we feel it is our responsibility to make sure we have those conversations, but they don't have to be right out of the gate. They don't have to be on day one when, when patients are just 
hearing this information for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And you've touched on this. You, you just mentioned it in the answer to the last question, but you also mentioned it earlier. So the location of the tumor, how important is that? I know you talked about it sort of being a mass with tentacles. Can you talk about the location and what that means for patients? Yeah, so the location means a lot. Um, there are some locations of tumor where patients, just because of the location, statistically, they have a better chance of long-term survival uh, versus a poorer chance of long-term survival. Um, we know that tumors that are in easily accessible areas that can be removed by the neurosurgeon, at least all the neurosurgeon can see, those patients tend to do better. And certainly from a quality of life standpoint, tumors that are in quieter areas of the brain are going to have, you know, those patients may have little to no symptoms at all. Whereas a tumor, even a small tumor that's in just the wrong spot is going to cause a lot of symptoms, a lot of deterioration of quality of life. Um, so it's kind of like real estate, you know, location, location, location. Um, it really plays a huge role in the therapies we can offer in how aggressive we can be. And then, and really most and foremost, it really plays a huge role in the function of the patient. Yeah. So, so many different factors to consider when they're diagnosed. Yes. And speaking of diagnosis, um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And, and I kind of want to take a step back because it would be great if you could explain explain to the audience, what is a biomarker? How does it come into play with GBM? Um, and why is it important that they understand that? Yeah. So biomarker testing is, it's kind of another step in the, um, in the evaluation of a tumor and in, in the evaluation of a cancer to look for various genes and proteins and other substances within that tumor that can help provide additional in information about that particular cancer. Uh, so while a patient might have lung cancer, when we look at the biomarkers, it goes a lot deeper than that. And there's a lot more nuance and, and the tumors can be very different in two different patients. So there's, there's this unique pattern of biomarkers for each patient. Um, in some biomarkers can actually um, affect how certain cancer treatments work, or they may give us more options for treatments to use for patients. This is much more developed in a lot of the other solid tumors in the body, the lung cancers, the breast cancers, the prostate cancers. We, we still don't know a ton about biomarkers in the brain. We can test for biomarkers, we can identify biomarkers, but we don't have a ton of biomarkers at this point for GBM that actually, um, uh, that actu actually have real implications on what we can do for the patient. So it's something that's, um, that over the last decade or so has really been used a lot in, in clinical trials um, and, and trying to identify more and more biomarkers and more and more treatments that can, can target those biomarkers, so to speak. Um, but right now it's in GBM, it's really still something that we're working on and does not yet tend to be fully standard of care for a patient with a GBM. Okay. And I think, would you say um, it's really those sort of I've heard actionable biomarkers. So yep. there's a treatment that's available because we know enough, but hopefully the science continues to evolve. And Absolutely. in the future, the goal would be to, to have an actionable biomarker. Exactly. So when you get biomarker testing on your glioblastoma, they're going to give you a list of, of, of biomarkers. They're going to give you a list of targets. But if we don't have a drug or a treatment that targets that target, then it's kind of a moot point. And that's where we are. You know, we have a whole list of biomarkers, but the, the, the drug side is a little a little sparse. Yeah. It's like the race of testing versus, versus treatment. So exactly. that's, that's really helpful and interesting. Thank you. Um, okay. So you touched on this, but I want to dig in a little bit more deeply and it's, it's interesting timing because this week I was actually on a panel that was focused on, are we ready to talk cure and cancer? Yeah. So we hear all the time that the ultimate goal of cancer treatment is cure, but for GBM, is it, is it to slow down progression? Is it to improve quality of life? When you sit down with a patient to talk about the goal of treatment, what do you say? So, you know, I think um, as a, as a, as a medical community, yes, the goal is cure. We're, we're, we're working really hard. I've been working for almost 25 years to try to find the cure for this. Um, and while we've made progress, we're, we're clearly not there. Um, for an individual patient in my office, my goal for that patient is not to talk about cure. My goal for that patient is to talk about extending their survival as long as we can, while at the same time maximizing their quality of life. 
Um, so because we don't have a full understanding of what a cure means for a glioblastoma patient, even though, like I said, we have some patients who in a sense have been cured, we just don't know how they got there. So we don't focus on that in our practice. Um, we, we, like I said, we really focus on, on discussing what treatments can get us the most amount of time and maybe get us enough time to get to the next treatment that hasn't maybe even been developed yet. And then in the meantime, how, what, what kinds of things can we really hone in on to make sure that we're preserving your quality of life if it's, if it's good or improving it if there is some room for improvement? Yeah, and I love that you brought up the, um, we often think about sort of the value of hope, right? And it, and if you can live, you know, like the person who commented that their friend has been alive for six years, who knows what treatment's available then? So it's, Absolutely. you know, it provides that, that ability to help patients hope for what comes next. Yep. And can you tell us a little bit more about treatments for GBM? I know, you know, lots of people have heard about tumor treating fields or, or other things, but can you walk us through what treatments look like for GBM? Sure. And I, you know, I can kind of go in chronological order of when a patient might see these treatments. Um, and so just, just really quick reflecting on what you just said about, you know, buying time and, and increasing hope. When I first started doing this in 1998, all we had was, was kind of bar barbaric surgical approaches, um, radiation, which was not, was not that, um, it, it was kind of a broader radiation than we have now. We have a very pinpointed radiation now. And we didn't even really have a chemotherapy that worked. So we've, you know, I'm going to go through some, some therapies that we have now, and we have come a long way, um, but clearly we've, we've got, got more to improve on. So um, I've, we've mentioned a couple of times that, ma the, that the surgery is the first step. Maximal safe resection is what we call um, kind of the, the gold standard or the ideal that we're going for. And so the goal of the neurosurgeon is to get out as much of the tumor as they can safely and we know that patients who have a smaller amount of tumor at the onset of their treatment do better and live longer. So that would be the first step. Next is radiation therapy. So it's kind of, radiation is kind of a household name. Most people, people have heard of that. Um, most patients with a glioblastoma are going to receive what's called external beam radiation. And this is a treatment that uses the same type of radiation as x-rays. Um, and the radiation works by damaging the DNA of the cancer cell. The most common side effects from radiation are some hair loss, generally in the area where the tumor is. It's very rare to, to lose all of the hair from this type of radiation. Um, we can definitely see some fatigue. You can get some irritation of the scalp, and then patients can develop um, some, some problems with short-term memory, and that's usually permanent. There's not, there's not much that can be done to, to improve that. And most patients with a glioblastoma or other type of primary brain tumor will get anywhere from a three to six week course of radiation, usually a six week course. Mm -hmm. The next mainstay of treatment is chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy that we use most commonly in glioblastoma is called temozolomide. Um, this is an oral chemotherapy that patients take at home. And the idea of the temozolomide um, is to slow or stop the cancer cells from growing. Um, and because chemotherapy in general targets any cell in the body that's growing quickly, the side effects from chemotherapy tend to be um, seen in organs that also have their normal cells that are growing quickly. And so that includes um, side effects from the gut. So we'll have patients who develop nausea or changes in appetite or constipation. And that's because the normal cells of the gut are replicating very, very quickly. And then we'll also have patients who may have drops in their blood counts because the bone marrow where blood cells are created is also replicating its cells very quickly. And so those drops in blood counts from temozolomide could be mild or could be significant enough to require something like a transfusion or an injection to, to support those cells. One of the newer treatments that we have, and it's, it's a decade old, but that's still fairly new, is tumor treating fields. Um, uh, so tumor treating fields um, are delivered by a device that actually delivers a field of electricity or a, a field of electric energy to the brain and to the brain tumor. And again, it specifically targets fast growing cells um, with the idea that, that that electric energy is going to interfere with those fast growing tumor cells ability to divide and grow. Um, we can use tumor treating fields in combination with temozolomide, or we can use it, use them alone. 
Um, it's a very well tolerated therapy. Really the only side effect that we see is some irritation of the scalp. And that's because the tumor treating fields device includes four sticky pads that have to adhere directly to the scalp, to a, sh a clean shaven scalp. And that contact with the pads and the warmth and the moisture that that, that creates can cause some kind of mild to moderate irritation of the skin. The last kind of mainstay of standard of care treatment for a glioblastoma is something called monoclonal antibodies. And the specific drug in that category is something called bevacizumab or the brand name is Avastin. Um, so this is an intravenous treatment that targets a certain receptor on the walls of blood vessels throughout the body. Um, and bevacizumab has actually been shown in, in several studies in GBM to help reduce brain swelling and shrink the tumor down and improve symptoms and quality of life for patients with GBM. So we use bevacizumab a lot when we want to improve or pre uh, preserve a patient's function, or if we want to help them get off steroid medications, which can be a, a big problem for a lot of patients. Those are kind of the standard treatments. Outside of those, we do encourage whenever possible that patients do participate in clinical trials. Um, a clinical trial, um, in a clinical trial, we're looking at new treatments or new combinations of treatments that are studied to better understand their safety and effectiveness in controlling the cancer. And really the reason we encourage participation in trials is because we, we don't have a cure for GBM. Um, or other brain tumors. And really the road to finding that cure or better treatments is really dependent upon people participating in trials. I'm so glad you brought that up, Jennifer, because one of the things we hear from people, especially people who don't have um, a history of cancer in their family, or they're not, they don't come from a scientific background is, I don't want to do a clinical trial because I'll be a lab rat or I'll, Anything. you know, I'll, I'll get a placebo. Right. And so when you're dealing with a brain tumor, you don't want to get a placebo. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that and what the clinical trial actually looks like? Yeah. So I think one thing for every patient to remember is that any cure or treatment that we currently have for any type of cancer was found through a clinical trial. Uh, and so we can't get to that point without patients being willing to do that. Um, you know, I, I like to tell the story of the mother of a previous colleague of mine who was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia. And she was, I think, about 60 years old at the time. And she decided after failing various therapies to go on a clinical trial. And that drug cured her leukemia and went on to get FDA approved for the treatment of her cancer. And she's alive today, 25 years later. Um, and so, so that is how we, that is how we reach the cure. That is how we reach the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important for patients to understand that you're never going to go into a cancer trial and be given just a placebo. That right. is completely unethical. Um, we can't do that to cancer patients because we know what cancer is going to do if we don't treat it, it's going yeah. to grow. And so instead of getting a placebo or just a placebo in cancer trials, which you might get in a, you know, a vaccine trial or an asthma trial or a foot cream trial, right. um, you might get a placebo, but in a cancer trial, more than likely, if you didn't get um, randomly assigned to get the, um, the experimental drug or the experimental treatment, you would get another treatment that's considered standard of care. So for example, if you're a newly diagnosed patient and um, you, know, you are eligible for a clinical trial, they may say you could get radiation plus an experimental therapy, or you could get radiation plus temozolomide, which is the standard of care. You're not going to get left out in the rain. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you, Jennifer. We hear it so much. So I like to reiterate that to patients so they truly understand. Um, so this has been a ton of scientific information, and I'm just thinking about being the patient sitting here receiving the information. And so as you support these patients going through their journey, and I also want to ask this question because I know we have a lot of caregivers in the audience, the Facebook Live audience too. So let's think about patients and caregivers, but what are the biggest concerns that they bring to you when they're going through this process and how do you help them cope? Yeah. That's a big question, and there's a lot of answers for it. We could talk all day about it, but um, I think that the most the most common thing that patients and caregivers, especially caregivers, are concerned about is quality of life. Um, you know, they've been given this diagnosis, they've been given a limited amount of time statistically, 
um, and they want to be sure that um, that the time that they do have is as good as it can be. And so in our practice, you know, the way that we approach that is that we do tend to involve our colleagues from our palliative care team very early in the process. Um, I think a lot of people have kind of a, a misunderstanding of what palliative care is. And so when their medical team approaches them about it, they think, oh my, this, this is the same thing as hospice. My medical team has given up on me. They think this is the end of the road and that is not at all the case. Um, palliative care specialists do manage hospice for some people, but their main role is really just to be an added layer of support for patients and families, to really spend time focusing on physical and emotional symptom management. Um, they can address spirituality and they can look into interventions to help improve or maintain a patient's day-to-day -day quality of life. Those are things that we try to touch on when we're in a visit with, you know, with our patient in the neuro-oncology clinic, but it can be really tough in a half an hour or even an hour time span to touch base on diagnosis, prognosis, seizures, steroid dose, your, you know, disability forms, what to expect, how are you tolerating your chemotherapy, and then to say, oh, by the way, let's work on your quality of life. Right. So we recognize how enormously important it is. And so we actually here at the U of R, and I think that many, many, um, you know, big programs around the country are going to have the same setup. We have a team where this is all they do day in and day out is try to help patients maximize their quality of life. That's amazing. And so, I mean, the quality of life is important for all cancer patients, but I think especially with a cancer like GBM, so, so incredibly important. And we know again, that the caregivers, you know, it's their quality of life too. So Absolutely. we encourage caregivers to find ways to take good care of themselves. And there's just so many different factors from, you know, the logistical, the day-to-day -to, -day, to the social and emotional, to wanting to make sure that your loved one has the best quality of life possible. So um, it's so incredibly important. And um, organizations, including CSC, have lots of resources to help people um, who have GBM to learn more about the disease or to address quality of life issues. So there are supports out there for sure. Yep. And Jennifer, I know um, kind of going back to the multidisciplinary team who you just talked about, and I love that you brought up palliative care because I, I, as a social worker, I've talked to many patients that they hear palliative care and they think hospice and they get very uncomfortable, but that's not the case. Um, and so it's so incredibly important to understand the different roles within the care team. And I know that you feel strongly that um, GBM patients are seen at least once by a neuro-oncologist. So tell me why you feel strongly about that. And um, for someone who may have difficulty getting to a specialist, is there an option to connect with a neuro-oncologist via telemedicine, which has been very high priority and in the news with um, the pandemic lately? Yeah. So yeah, thank you for asking that because I do feel very strongly about that. And, um, you know, so I've been in neuro-oncology for, as I said, almost 25 years. And I have seen, you know, patients from all over the country um, who've been, been getting really great care in their hometowns. Um, but I do feel like brain cancer is so very different than can other cancers in the body. Um, mm -hmm. And as we've said, you know, patients and caregivers are facing very different challenges than patients with those, those other cancer types because, you know, the tumor being located in command, command central. Um, we've learned over the years that there's a lot of nuance to interpreting imaging uh, as it relates to a patient with a brain tumor and determining a patient's response to treatment. Uh, I take my hat off to general medical oncologists. I think that they are superheroes. The fact that these, these men and women treat tens and twenties and thirties of different diseases, you know, hundreds, even sometimes different diseases is really, really remarkable. But I also think it's important for patients with G GBM, especially out in the community or in rural parts of the country to have an understanding that their general medical oncologist may only treat one, maybe two GBM every year. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to have someone on their team who has really extensive expertise. So one gift that you mentioned that co the COVID pandemic has really given us is this rapid adoption of telemedicine. And I'm really hopeful that even once this 
this pandemic subsides, that the, you know, the powers that be, mainly the insurance companies and actually um, Congress also, allow us to continue to see patients over telemedicine because it really has um, extended our reach to patients in their, in their own communities. I do know that the vast majority of large cancer centers are offering telemedicine consultation to their, their community cancer patients and definitely to, to glioblastoma patients. And so with that barrier of distance being removed, there's really not a good excuse to not get an expert opinion. And then I also know, certainly it's the case at our center, and I, and I know that at other centers, because we sometimes send patients from our center to larger cancer centers, that most neuro-oncologists are really happy and willing to provide ongoing advice to a patient they've seen just once, um, and really maintaining that relationship throughout the patient's journey with GVM while they continue to get their actual cancer care delivered locally. Yeah, I, I, um, I work with our policy team at the Cancer Support Community, and I keep joking that we went from the telehealth and telemental health system of the 1980s to the system of 2020 overnight. It's magic how things can happen when we really need them to, right? It's really magic. So I, I actually had the first telemedicine program in our cancer center, and I'd been doing it for about a year for our more rural patients, just for you know patients who were already established patients of ours, but just for checkups so that they didn't have to come all the way into Rochester to save them the time and the energy. And it took them 18 months to get my, my telemedicine program off the ground. And then COVID hit, and everybody else was up in three weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and thank goodness. I'm glad that they were up. But, right. you know, it's it's very interesting to see what happens in the midst of a pandemic. So and it saved me all the time writing all those papers I was going to write about whether or not it was you know feasible to deliver neuro-oncology care through telemedicine. Because here we are. We're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'll say, too, something we've heard from patients is when a patient, you know, if it's not coming in to give blood or do something physical, um, if a patient's feeling sick and yeah. doesn't want to come in, I was just interviewed for an article on parking, the cost of parking, right? Like if a patient, there's so many things that can be saved. Um, the caregiver may not have to take time off from work to help Huge. the patient get in. And so just, it's, it's so incredible. So just a plug for telehealth and telemental yeah. health. I hope that we can figure out how it can be here to stay for sure. Call your representatives, tell them you want to keep it. Absolutely. And, and CSE actually has some um, telehealth, telemental health information on our website. So right. um, Jennifer, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question, but I'm curious because it's clear that you're so passionate about this. But how did you get into neuro-oncology? How did you decide that that was going to be your field of practice? Um, I think like with a lot of great things, it was kind of an accident. Um, so uh, when I was graduating from PA school, I got a job as a neurosurgical PA um, down in New York City. and um, I happened to be working with a neurosurgeon who was also a neuro-oncologist. And this was right around the time that um, temozolomide came on the market. So in the, in the very late 90s, early 2000s. And I was working in neurosurgery and working with her. And then we had a chemotherapy we could finally give to patients. And so she wanted to start giving that chemo to patients. And she wanted to start doing clinical trials. And so she asked me if I wanted to leave the OR and go out to the office and take care of patients in an, in an ambulatory setting, which I did. I kind of jumped at that chance. I really enjoyed neurosurgery, but I prefer to, to talk to, to, a, to a conscious patient and then deal with them asleep on the, on the operating room table. And so we just kind of figured out how to, how to prescribe chemotherapy and how to run clinical trials. And it's been 20 years and I can't imagine doing anything else. Somehow I just fell into it and it was perfect. And it must be incredible to be there from basically the beginning. I mean, when treatment really got its legs and to see it over the last 20 years. So um, I'm sure that that watching that and continuing to see what happens with the future, because as we've seen over the last, especially couple of decades, the funding and focus on oncology has been extraordinary. And so um, I'm excited to see where it goes from here. I am as well. And, you know, we have made such strides um, and, and the rapidity with which we're making strides in other cancers is just remarkable. And so I, I can't wait to see that hit GBM. Absolutely. And I'm going to remind our audience to please put any questions you have um, for us today. Happy to ask Jennifer to answer those questions. Um, but before I turn it over to, to any Q&A we might have, Jennifer, it's GBM is, it can be scary. It can be overwhelming. Um, you have provided such extraordinary information to us today, but do you have any final thoughts, things that you would want patients to know who were just diagnosed? Um, you know, I think I, I want to remind patients out there that 
like you said, this is a tough disease, um, but we do have real stories of success and survival. And remember when you're sitting in the office and you're being given this difficult information and this dis difficult news that you are not a statistic, you are an individual. And, and we don't have any reason to think that you won't be one of those people who, who really survives. Um, it's important to get all the facts, you know, and, and prepare for that worst outcome, prepare for the rainy day. But once you have those facts, move on and decide that you're going to hope for the best. Uh, and then really just to encourage people to find support, either, you know, patients and caregivers to find support either together or individually and have a lot of conversations early on with your medical team about your goals and your priorities and how you want your medical care delivered for you so that we can do all that we can possibly do in our power to help you achieve those goals and, and help you move through the process. I love that. Yeah, open communication, talking to your healthcare team. And I had a mentor once who referred to um, something she called the changing constellation of hope, which I love because hopes can change over time, right? On day one of your diagnosis, you may hope, I, I don't want cancer, I want a cure. I, you know, a year or two down the road, you may hope for, for something different. And, and at the point that a patient, any patient um, who is at the end of their life from any disease, they may wish for a good death and, and closure with their loved ones and things like that. So I, I really love that concept of the changing constellation of hope, but the only way that patients, um, you know, you need to communicate with your healthcare team Absolutely. and help them understand what you hope for and what your values are. And, and so um, I know, Jennifer, that I would be very lucky to have you by my bedside if if I face a GBM and I, your passion and your experience really come through. And that's why we asked you to do this Facebook live. So we are so appreciative of your time and expertise. And I have a feeling you'll get, um, you'll get some, some follow-up from, from folks on the, uh, the Facebook live. So um, I see that we do have one question that's come in. So I'm going to pose this to you. Um, why uh, it's asking why uncouplers are not used. Do you know, know what that means? No coupler is no. All right. Stumped okay. Well, we'll we'll that's a, that's a, a stump, but we'll we'll follow up and find out maybe from Pedro if we can find out what that is and um, have him reach out to us if we can be helpful and get information. Great. So, all right, it looks like we are coming down to the end of our time. So, Jennifer, I just want to thank you again so much your information and your insights. Um, I know that this is no doubt invaluable to, to those tuning in. And I also wanna thank again, our sponsor, NovoCure. Um, we are so thankful to be able to provide this information for the hundreds of thousands of patients out there who tune in to, to all of the work that CSC does. So it's been my pleasure to have you join us today for this great conversation. And if anybody listening has questions or watching about glioblastoma or GBM, making treatment decisions, biomarker testing, or anything else we've discussed today or generally about cancer, I encourage you to connect with our experienced and licensed navigators at our Cancer Support Helpline. And that number is 888-793-9345. Nine three five five, and again, that's eight 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 seven nine three nine three five five. And so, for for Pedro or anybody else with questions that we didn't get a chance to answer today, please call our helpline. They can help you find the information, and you can also visit our website at cancersupportcommunity.org. So, um, Jennifer, with that, just thank you, thank you, thank you. You're incredible, and truly appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Absolutely. And thank you to our audience.